Okay, recording started. You guys can get ready or get started whenever you're ready. All right, guys. Uh, Gabe, you're still muted. I don't know if that's intentional. Yep. It is intentional. Okay. All right, so um, we've gathered here today to uh, do the flip-flop rolls that we did at the off-site. So me and Gabe are going to do that. It's getting recorded by Bill. It'll be posted to YouTube. So uh, hopefully um, you guys get a good idea of how that is supposed to work, um, how the process is supposed to work. I'm going to be doing the drafting part. Gabe's going to be doing the takeoff part. We're going to talk each other through all this stuff. Um, trying to open up that profile set in Bluebeam. There we go. Um, so the files, they're in the M drive, which is, uh, it's on the Fremont server, WW data HQ operations, drafting, zoom site, like that. Just in case you're out of the office. The, the files are here under day two flip flop rolls. I've made a copy of this entire folder uh, right here, flip flop live, which is what we're doing right now. And that's where I'm going to be working off of. And that's where Gabe will be working off of, just so we don't have to copy it back and forth later. Um, so if you want to do this activity yourself, you can copy this whole folder to your hard drive um, and follow along. I don't know if following along is going to work very well. We only have two hours. Uh, maybe follow along with the recorded video later. Okay. Uh, if you have any questions, um, I guess you can just raise, there's 40 people in here, my goodness. So just raise your hand, hopefully, uh, Bill, if you would be so kind, if someone yeah, raises you, their hand, you can- You could also put them in the chat and I'll see them there. I've got that window up. Okay, yeah, let me get the chat up as well. <clears throat> Okay. So yeah, put if you have any questions, raise your hand or or say something in chat, and uh, we'll try and get to it if we see it. And if we don't see it, Bill, jump in. Cool. All right. So I've opened up. Let me move my blue beam window over. Where did it go? Oh, it's hiding. It's hiding behind everything. Zoom, for some reason, is bigger than it is on top of everything else. So this is the elevation that we're going to be doing. It's a small little strip window, um, strip window sill, mini Mac head. Typical verticals, nothing too fancy. OK, I'm going to have this off um, off screen on my other monitor. So, so you guys won't see it very often, but it's a pretty simple elevation. All right, Gabe, you're right. walking me through this. So yeah, like Zach said, we're going over the flip-flop rules. Um, you know, everybody kind of went through the drafting part of it um, pretty, pretty well, but um, we kind of want to just go over it for those of you that were getting stuck or, you know, didn't, wasn't able to complete the process. So we'll be going step by step. So um, we'll go down the list and I will direct Zach on the shop drawing part of it. Oh yeah, I didn't mention the instructions list. Yes, the instructions are there, which I have open. Okay, you have it open? Yeah. All right, so there's the instructions. This is the Revit template, which is what I have open in Revit right now, 2019. And then that profile set that I showed you in Bluebeam is this one here. All right, I think we're ready. All right, so what do I do first, Gabe? Like Zach said, he opened up that template and we're using Revit 2019. So we opened it up in Revit 2019. Um, that is kind of has some things already uh, put in there for you, like the details that Zach was showing. But what we need to do is recreate that elevation and put it on a sheet and you can see those details. All right. So what we want to do first, um, first step is start with the provided Revit template. We did that. 
the second step is to create a wireframe wall. So once you have your project open, um, you go to level one in your project browser on the right. I'm gonna use my annotations so everybody uh, knows what, what I'm talking about. So right here, you have the floor plans level one, you double clicked on it, and it's now bold. So that's what now, you use. Your project browser could be moved around. And I think by default, Revit has it over on the left side, but um, I don't know, I put mine on the right if I can get it back over here, just in case you're looking around for it. It could be somewhere else, so project browser level one. And this just lists everything that's in your project. Use at the top, sheets down below. Um, mm -hmm. And now we're in level one. This is your view window, so this is what where you would be drawing. Um, the, the cool thing with Revit 2019, is it has tabs. So at the tabs, you see every view that you open. Um, exact open is now a tab and you can kind of just go between them. If you don't want it, you just a little X, but um, yeah, there you go. All right, so now the first thing we've got to do is create that wireframe wall. So to do that, um, once you're in this level uh, level one, you would go to the architecture tab and click on this wall on the left side. I mean, if you hit the drop down, you'll see there's uh, different types of walls. You have architecture, stuff, rule, wall by face. Uh, we typically just use the, art, the wall architecture. There's different properties associated with them. That's kind of why they're there. But we, for our case, we just use the architecture. And then um, once you have that selected, you would want to choose the WW wireframe in the properties. Um, as Zach is showing you, you hit the drop down menu. Um, there's different wall types. Um, and for our case, what we want to use is the WW wireframe, um, which should be created uh, in this template already. So you'll select that, and um, you could put some uh, options in if you want, but we're just going to just create one and we'll adjust them as we go. So once that's selected, um, Zach's going to go to the view window and select uh, his starting point, click somewhere, and you're going to move your mouse to the left to create uh, the wall. And we need to know how big the wall we want to make. We can make it you know, 20 feet for now and adjust it later if we don't know what size it's supposed to be. According to the PDF, it looks like it's 20 feet, so. All right, perfect, 20 feet is, there you go. And then uh, once you uh, click twice, it's gonna make the wall and then it's gonna ask you, you still wanna keep creating it? If you do, you can just keep clicking. If you don't, you can just hit escape twice. Let's escape one more time that we are not making it. There you go. Right on. All right, so that is your first wall that you want to make. And we can adjust the size of the width if we made it something bigger. We just click on it and you can see this temporary dimension. And change it to whatever you need to be. So 20 feet, 30 feet, it's going to grow equally. 20 feet, perfect. And then uh, we, can, we can also adjust the, um, the height, but we'll, we'll do that after this. Um, the next step is on the instructions is to load mullions. Um, what we need to do is to create uh, or look at that. PDF and see which mullions we need to load in. So Zach brings uh, over that PDF. All right. And we go to the details. Oops. Too far. Oh, you... darn it. Sorry, I'm new to Bluebeam. You'll see the family names under the details, and it tells you which ones to load in. So you got SW75, 1117X001, DL, or in our case, it would be that. So we would need to get all of these and load them into the project. Um, typically, we'd have like a database that has them all stored, but in this case, there's only a couple, so we're going to load them in. Kind of one by one. Okay. So if you go to back to Revit and you go to WW modeling tab, there's this load mullions button uh, that will allow you to 
load in specific mullions that are in the on the server. So you can see that it opens up the profile area by default, and we would have to uh, select the mullions we want to load in. So I'm just going to use my uh, my PDF here. I'm going to have it off onto my other monitor and just pick all the ones that I want. Right? Is that the best way? Yep. All right. So I need this one. And one thing to note, the family name here says dash D because it's the detail family. The corresponding profile that you're going to pick is going to be the same thing dash P instead. So they're not quite the same, but they're identical in every other way. So I need that one. Do the uh, six one one six oh seven five. That one. Sometimes they don't have a dash p after it. Even must be an old one. Sounds a p zero seven five. Oh, it's the the p is in a different spot. Thirty one seventy. Zero, zero, three. And he's holding control. Yeah, they're all multiple. getting listed here. Thirteen. Yeah, and we noticed, One. you know, before, um, you know, we had to do this every time. So that's kind of why we created the uh, the load from the database because doing this could cause some errors. If you pick the wrong one, you have to redo it. So um, I'm showing you kind of a way you can just load them one at a time or a couple. 56.91.008 and 92.007. So I think I got them. And then the other jam I picked. Was 001 PR. Yep. OK. Is it open? And then this is going to ask you, what's the offset? So all of our families are made to the back of pocket um, on the details. So we need to push them to the face of system. So that's what this minus two and a quarter is. That's that dimension. You can hit okay for all of them. And then if um, there's a specific angle, like a corner is like, you know, if it's a 90, that'd be a 45 degree rotation. Um, but all of ours are either jams or, or sills or something. So they're, no ro they're not rotated. So you can just put zero for degrees. So if I had a corner, I'd probably have to run that command again and put in 90s and zero. Right. Yeah. yeah, you'd be 45 and minus 45. I'm not going to load the detail families. Is that right? Yeah, don't, you don't need to load those. It, okay. It's an option in case we uh, also need to put them on sheets, but we have all of ours on sheets already. Now you see that it's upgrading them because they're 2017. And nope, I got this on the other monitor. There you go. Successfully loaded seven millions. Okay. If you wanted to see those, they're in the families section of the project browser. And um, the profiles that we imported are listed under profiles here. And then that tool also makes the mullions that go with it. So under curtain wall mullions, rectangular mullions, they're listed here. Cool. So the next thing is to go to Quasar, but we have to actually get the correct height of the wall we also, first. We also need the verticals. Yeah. For some reason, we left that out of the instructions. Oh, did we? Yeah. Oops. All right. So we need to be able to get the correct height of the wall. What does the PDF show? It shows it being 10 feet tall. So like Zach did, you can either come to 3D view to see it better, 
Um, if you click on your 3D view or your house at the top. Yeah, I like hitting the house button. It'll take you to the 3D view. And once Zach selected, you can see that it highlighted. And we need it to make it 10 feet tall. So you can come over here to the unconnected height, change that to 10 feet. And then it will drop it down. All right, good to go. So a little bit about selecting in Revit, just in case. Um, I had to, to get that option, I needed to select the wall, the actual whole wall. But there are other things you can click in here. If you hit hit tab, you can get mullions or glass or any other sort of objects in there. So that's how Revit works. If there's more than one thing under your mouse, you can hold your mouse still and then hit tab to cycle through all the different objects that you could be selecting. So if you're having trouble getting the actual wall, uh, find a spot on the edge of the wall, tab until you can get it. And you can also see on the very bottom left corner, it says walls, curtain wall, WW wireframe. That's what I would select if I clicked. And... Yeah, down there where, where the arrow was. So while you're tabbing, you can see the names of the different things you're tabbing through. Yeah, and um, I forget the command. I don't know if it's shift tab or alt tab, but if you cycle through and you pass something, you can go. Yeah, the other it's way. shift tab. Shift, shift tab. tab will go the opposite direction. So if you over, if you overshoot, you can do shift tab to go backwards. All right. So now we need the vertical curtain grids. So. Um, Based on our PDF, we have four bays. So we're going to have to put um, what's called curtain grids in Revit. So if you go back to the architecture tab, you go to the curtain grid uh, command. And then um, we need to put um, the five foot spacing. So as you can see, Zach is hovering over the bottom or top or side, uh, if you're doing horizontal the sides um, to be able to put a grid. It doesn't like the middle of the glass, um, so you have to want to be able to put it on the edges. And it gives you a temporary dimension, so you can kind of uh, know where you're placing it. So you can put it at five feet, place it. And if you want to change it later, you can kind of place them and then click on the grids to. Uh, yeah, I wanted them. to show them how they could change them. Mm -hmm. So this one here. If I select the grid line, again, you might have to tab to get to it. That's the grid line. Um, it shows me the temporary dimensions. This one's five foot, and we have five foot bays everywhere. So this one's in a good spot. This one here, I made it four foot from the previous. So I can just click on this text here and put in five foot. If you just put in the number five, they will also treat it as feet. So unlike AutoCAD, if you just put in five, it'll treat it as five inches. Um, but in Revit, no units means feet. So now that's five. So this is a kind of common pattern in Revit. You always want to select the thing that you want to move or change first. And then you change whatever dimensions they give you or any other dimensions that you may have drawn yourself. Um, if you don't select first, you won't get those dimensions. If you select the wrong thing, then the wrong thing will move. Like if I select this guy and type in five foot here, it's going to move the thing I selected, not the thing I wanted to move. So you kind of always have to select the thing that you want to change first. And now I got five foot everywhere. All right, perfect. Uh -oh. Now that we have the spacing. Uh oh, I hear baby. Yeah, that's why I muted. <laughs> so. <laughs> So now that we have this, the next step is to load the mullions into Quasar, right? Mm hmm So uh, it's in the modeling tab. Modeling. Elevation oh. generator. Elevation generator, not Quasar. Elevation generator. Yeah, Quasar is just a code name. I'm going to dock it up here at the top. Oh, that's super wide. Is there a middle ground? No, I'll just dock it across the top then. 
All right, so we got our elevation the right size. We put in the spacing, and now we, we're going into the elevation generator to actually have it create all the units for us. Put all the millions where they need to go. So the first thing to do is go to import, and you want to import mullions and systems. And it's actually going to look in your project and grab all the mullions that uh, you loaded in. All of these listed here. Yep. All right. Now that those are loaded in, uh, let's look back on what the next thing is. We're going to import the elevation into Quasar. So again, you go to import and then you select element. And then um, you have to, there's a little trick to this. You have to like use your middle mouse to kind of pan in the view to kind of activate it. And then it'll allow you to select the elevation. So you want to... So if I didn't do the pan, I'll just, it'll look like this and you'll be like, I can't select anything. Mm -hmm. But if you pan a little bit, now this view is activated and you can select. And you, the key is to make sure you select the, the, uh, the wireframe elevation, which will mm -hmm. highlight. Click that, and it actually loads it into your elevation generator screen. All right. The next thing is, yeah, you can actually you know, do the same thing like you're doing in Revit is panning and zooming. Um, a uh, couple key things to note is like you probably want to hover around something, right, Zach? Like you have to have like oh orbit, orbit around it, yeah. Um, yeah. Another thing you can do there's a new there's a couple new buttons up here. Um, you can this button here will zoom extents. So if you find yourself like in a blank looking spot, you can click this zoom extents button and it'll bring you back. Or you can double click your middle mouse button. Uh, the other, th this other button matches your view to Revit. So if I click it now, um, it's going to orbit around to match Revit. So if I take Revit's view cube and go like that, I can hit this button and now it's lined up. Very nice. Uh, if I had some weird view in Revit like this, it just matches it. So. And also, when you import an elevation, it always automatically goes to match Revit. So you can tell which way is inside and outside, or where this elevation is relative to the building. But I'm just going to line it up like that. Nice. Good to know. All right. Next thing is we need to apply the mullions and systems in Quasar. So we need to tell it what goes where, right? What the jam is, which profile family is a sill, the head, all that. And we need to tell it where the units are. So Zach is going to hover his mouse and select the sill. Yeah, I like using the window select for this because a lot of times your glass is going to be on top or your, this face of system thing, which is the yellow, is going to be on top of everything. And you won't be able to click the mullion unless you rotate around to the backside. So if you just draw a window, kind of like AutoCAD, you can get all the stuff that you want. Uh, apparently, I have to orbit it slightly. There we go. Oh, why isn't it selecting? There. I had to tweak my my uh, view a little bit. That was a bug that Jessica showed me. It's on my list. OK, and we want. So these are the mullion options in Quasar. I have all the sill pieces selected. I can see that here under grid location. So the main mullion is right here. If there's only one mullion, you always put it on this top line. Um, it's the only mullion. So for this one, according to the details, is this right here. And then for the caulking or track, it's this one here, according to the details. I'm just reading these right off the details. Um, these dialog boxes are, or these drop down lists are organized so that these are kind of mullions up here in the top, and then down here are all the perimeters, or at least what it thinks of as a perimeter. And exactly the opposite for the, the caulking track box. It puts all the perimeters and stuff on, on the top, and then all the mullions down below. Um, 
I guess that's it for this mullion, right? Uh, if I needed to change where this mullion is, if I wanted to shift it up or down, I can change this number here. But that's not the case. And now it's this gray color with black. The black is the caulking or the track. Alright, sweet. Should I save that as a preset? Maybe. Uh, you tell me. I don't know. Is that on the list for things? No. Is saving the system on the list? Mm, it just is apply system. Okay. Well, I'll 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 do it just because it's relatively new feature. Um, I can save this as a preset, so I can. This is the Mullion preset box here. If I hit this plus button, um, I can give this combination of parameters a name. So this is my one on 501 detail. So I'll just call it one on 501, maybe SIL. One on 501. So if I ever need to put that in again, I can, um, like if, if this wasn't here, like this was a new elevation, I could select this and just choose that preset out of the list and it'll put everything there the way I had it. And I'll, I'll do that again on all these other mullions. So uh, yep. this one, according to you, the- You I'll just continue just, the process, right? For all of them? Yeah, I'm going to the head now. This is two on 501. Um, it has a one and a quarter inch cock joint and that head family that I have here. So one, one and a quarter like that. And I'll save that as head two on 501. You don't have to make presets. Um, it's just handy if you're gonna do a lot of these. Select my jam. Same thing. Let's go to the. I'm switching pages and stuff on the on the PDF. So this is four one one three PL, and the cock joint is one and a quarter. Again, just like that. No offsets needed. I'll save this as jam left. One on five fifty one. Other jam. So Zach, while you're doing that, so what we'll, we'll, what would be a case where you would use the shift, the grid line shift? Um, if I didn't draw this, uh, usually you, when you're drawing a wireframe, you would draw it at the exact location that you want it to end up being. Mm -hmm. um, but if you didn't draw this, maybe you're using Quasar on a sales model, for instance. The sales model has different locations uh, for the sill, for the jams. Like the jams are at center line on a sales model. So you, to, for the operations model, you have to bump that line out mm -hmm. by some number. So that's what I usually use that for. Same with uh, heads and sills. All the perimeters might need to shift out uh, with a sales model. Got it. And that shift also gets saved in this preset, so you can, uh, you know, restore it on any mullion that you want. Jam right. Uh, this is three on five fifty one. Um, it won't let you right now. There's another bug with this preset thing. If any one of these is blank, like if this one was blank, it wouldn't let me do a save a preset so um and that happens like at stack joints that kind of thing so i need to fix that okay and now uh, we do the verticals right yep now i gotta do the verticals i'm gonna just to show you how filtering works you can um select a bunch of stuff and then these little buttons that filter what's what you have selected up here so in this case i'm looking for the vertical so i want all the mullion segments and then i just want the verticals and now the verticals are selected. It's hard to tell because they're, but they are, they're selected. There's three verticals selected. 
And this vertical is between units. So any of the interior mullions, you get this option. And that just tells Quasar that it's, or the elevation generator, that that's a border of a unit. So you have one unit on one side of that mullion and a different unit on the other side. So that's true in this case. That um, enables this box. So now I can choose my, my left mullion, which is, uh, which is the 5691 part, mm -hmm. this one. And then the right mullion to go next to it is 5692. And now those are gray as well. And I can save that as a preset. Vertical two on 551. I think I've got everything in here. There's also this face of system. It has some options. You can flip it so that when it, when it makes the, uh, when it makes the elevation in Revit again, it's going to be reversed. And shift face the system will move it in and out from where this one was. So again, with the sales model, the face of system sometimes isn't the where you want it in operations. So you may use that to, to change it. All right. And then do we want to show how to save the system? Yeah, let's do that. So I'm going to save all of these settings, all the mullions, the face of system shift and all that stuff under systems and just hit save. And then this window pops up and I can uh, give it a name. Like this is a strip window. Uh, and it is unitized. This, you shouldn't need to check this unless it's a, uh, a single unit punched opening because it Quasar doesn't know that it's a, unit unless um, this is checked. So the ways this would automatically be checked is if you have something that is marked as is between units. But if it's a single punched opening, you may not have a mullion that is between units. So you may have to check this box yourself manually to differentiate it from a, from a stick window or something like that. All right. So that gets saved as part of this drawing. So anyone that opens up this drawing will see that system um, in their list. So they can apply that system to any other uh, Quasar wall. Nice. Same with all those Mullion presets. They're also saved in, in this drawing or in this uh, Revit file. All right. I think we're good with the elevation generator, right? Everything set, mm -hmm. your preset set. Now we need to come into Revit. And what's going to happen is you're actually, we're actually going to export this from Quasar or from elevation generator to Revit. So we need to delete this elevation because if we don't, it's going to be right on top of each other. Yeah. Alternatively, you can uh, put an offset on this so that it exports like two feet in front of the system or something like that and then shift them around. But in this case, I'm just going to delete this one and export this one. Yep, export, exporting the model. So the reason that we use Quasar at all is it simplifies the making of these units. Because before, before the one that I drew before, it didn't have specific mullions. Everything was flat. There was no units. It was basically a stick wall. Um, but now, after going through Quasar and back, it's now units. And all the mullions are in the right are the right ones. Should I do sections just to prove it, or if you want, well, we'd have to make elevation and stuff. Isn't that next on the list, or? Um, oh no, it's, it's run GG two point oh. Well, let's actually make an elevation because we're gonna have to do that eventually. Okay. And I just popped a question in the chat. Would that export put that model in at the same coordinates as that thing that you just deleted? Exactly. It'll be, well, they'll have the same uh, sort of face of system in Revit as far as Revit's concerned, which for sales model, that face of system might be the face of glass. 
for the operations model, it's usually an inch and a quarter in front of the face of glass. Um, but they would be lined up at that point. Um, that's what this is. And you can change that by changing this number here so that it could be that you can have this one behind or in front by any number that you want. But yeah, it otherwise it's right where it was, where the original was. Good question. All right, so let's go back to our level one. So I'm gonna close this. I think we're done with Quasar, right? Yeah. Just to reclaim some space. Go back to level one. And we're actually gonna create an elevation view of this so we can kind of see, uh, mm -hmm. so we can put that on a sheet. So what you wanna do is you wanna go to the view tab Oh, I usually to... I usually just hit this button up here. Right. right elevation. Oh yeah, I guess you can't do that. They don't give you a choice. All right then. I usually draw details. That's probably what I'm thinking. Yeah, elevation, view, and then you're gonna come right in front. Yeah. And yeah, exactly what's that showing. You would select which one you want: quarter or three eighths, uh, or if it's segmented. I think we did quarter on the shop drawing set. Yeah, I believe so. Or it says three eighths. It says three eighths. Okay, yeah. well, I'll do three eighths then. Yep. And then just place it where you need to go. This thing will automatically like flip around. Yeah, it's trying to look at an element in the model. Did I accidentally place this one? Looks like it. Oh, no, no, I didn't. That was just a visual bug. <laughs> All right, so now that you've placed it, you can click on the arrow once and you can see the view extents. So you can kind of you know, drag them over if you need, make the view uh, smaller. And then you can also control the view depth here by dragging that in and out. Yep. Then you can actually go to the view by double clicking or right clicking, either way works. Double clicking gets you there. And now this is your view of that elevation. All right. Good to go. Good. So now the next thing is on our list is run GG 2.0. OK. So you want to go to WW modeling. And then there's this GG 2.0. Um, Alan has made an, a 3.0, but for this purpose, we're going to go with the 2.0. It's just an upgraded version. So once it once you select 2.0, uh, it's going to detect all of the walls um, that it finds, and there's only one, so you can just hit that check mark. Highlights it, you can see in the background, um, that's the one I want, and then you can just hit OK. So it's detecting which um, elevation is picking up. And it's actually looking at all the profiles on each piece of glass um, and looking at the database and putting all the data that it finds for each of these profiles in there. Uh, but first it's asking you, what's the glass makeup? Our typical is quarter, half quarter with a one inch offset from the face of system and a quarter inch ceiling um, interior width. If your glass makeup is different, you can modify this and it'll modify the family the glass in your project. But if that's all good, you can just hit OK. And now it's grabbing all the data from the database, and then it's putting all the values for the offsets, the bytes, um, on each of the, uh, the glass for each of those openings. So it, now it tells you that it's successfully loaded for bytes. Now. And you'll notice once I've done that, um... Oh, they're still yellow. Yeah, we haven't put the glass type yet. Okay. Yeah, once we put the glass types, they'll be blue. So uh, a good thing to do is to check it. So like you were talking about earlier, Zach, is that we take a live cut. So yeah. now you can use your, your section button. Yeah, I like this section button. This is how you draw details. Yep. So click if you're that. inspecting inspecting a model, you can just click that little button there and then you choose which detail you want. You usually don't want a section view. You usually want details full. Yep, and then you can go bottom to top or right to left, it doesn't matter. We'll look at this section first. Oh. Okay. 
Um, this controls how far. So if you want to see that vertical, you can pull it out there. I don't really want to see the vertical, so I'll leave it there. Double click on it, and then if you zoom in to the sill, you can see that we have our detail. That's the detail that looks exactly like we have in the profile set. Does have a border around it, um, probably from CAD, but um, you can yeah, see that's probably the CAD detail. Yeah, this is the correct glass with the gaskets and setting blocks. So if I did this before I did GG 2.0, you would see possibly incorrect byte gasket or block right here. But since yeah. I ran it, it, they're all set according to our standards in the database. And then you have your head. All right. OK, that's that one. And you can also check it going to right. Right to left in the way. Yeah, if this thing isn't going in the right direction, there's a little blue button up here with two arrows or somewhere nearby. So you can flip the detail to make it look the other direction. Yep. I mm -hmm. kind of got lucky and didn't even have to use that. Maybe it's because I drew it right to left or something. Yep. And then you would check your mullions, check your joints. That's one of the big things uh, from Yana is make sure your joints match the detail. So inch and a quarter. It's just a plug for Yana to check your joints. All right. You must be Glass on our payroll. <laughs> Glass looks good. Gaskets are good. Everything looks good. There you go. All right, so it looks like we're good there. OK, I'm going to delete these bubbles. Yep, go for it. Not 100% necessary since they won't print either way, but. All right, next thing we got to do is create uh, what we're calling a global parameter for the glass types. You don't have to do this part. It's just, I mean, it's good if you have a, uh, to do a lot of glass type because it saves you from opening that materials. Um, page every time a dialog box. So what we're going to do here um, now is create, um, we'll put in a gla one glass type first and then we'll make the global parameter. So what you want to do is select the glass. So you can either do it from this view or 3D view, it doesn't matter. Um, and like we said earlier, you got to tab into it. So you can see now that exact tab, it says WW glass standard. That's the one you want to select. So if you click on it, um, we want to designate the glazing material. So which material is this going to be? And for our case, type one, it's going to be a yeah vision type one. So if you click on in there, you see these three little dots and that will allow you to um, open up the materials. And then if you scroll all the way down, there's these WW vision one um, glass type. And the key thing here is we need to make sure that the glass parameter is set. So you click that button, it says one. If it doesn't, the takeoff program won't read it. So make sure you, when you if you ever have to duplicate it, you also fill in this parameter. And you can also change the color for whatever reason if you want to change it and also the transparency. But we're going to leave it all for now and just hit OK. So now I just assigned this glass type to just this piece of glass. So now, like you said, Zach, if you go back to the 3D view, you can see that it changed colors. Perfect. Sweet. So uh, we can do that. We can select all the glass and do the same thing. Uh, but what we want to do now is make that global parameter uh, so we can just select them and change them to the global parameter. So what you can do is select that piece of glass again. And then you see now this button here to the right of it, that's the associate global parameter. So I'm gonna actually create a parameter. It looks like it's already created um, vision and um, assign it to be this WW vision one. You can just hit okay. And now you can see it's grayed out. Um, oh, sorry. 
it's grayed out because you can't change it here. It's associated to the global parameter. So if you change the global parameter, all the instances that um, have it associated will be changed. So now I just have to put it on all these other ones. Yep, so you can either do a right click, select all instances in view, or um, a select panels on host, or it just depends on what you want to select. And you just click that associate parameter, change the vision, and just hit OK. Again, you don't have to make the parameter. It's just a, it's just a fast way to, uh, to do it. All right, so the glass material. Let's go back to our level or our elevation view. We're going to create a level two datum. Okay. So a couple ways to do this. You could go to architecture and go to level. Um, but an easier way to do it is since we already have level one, we can just copy this level one up and copy it up 15 feet. So if you select it, hit this copy button. Oh, fancy. And then you, you just give it a base point. You can just select somewhere, anywhere, yeah. and just go up 15 feet. 15? I think that's what it was. Yeah, 15. Yeah, it's 15. And for some reason, it's calling it level five. We can just click on that in the, yeah, and just change that to level two. There you go. All right. Now that we have the level, we want to dimension our elevation. So um, we want to be able to add dimensions to it. So once we're in the elevation view, go to WW modeling. And you're going to use this CWDT button. It's going to dimension the curtain wall that we select. So again, if you select it, it's going to have another dialog box similar to the GG 2.0. You can select that one. It's going to highlight and just hit OK. And then you can change the way it's going to come out. You can add, you know, an angle. There's a return, but we're just going to keep everything by default and just dimension based on the elevation view. So you just hit finish. Well, bam. Dimensions. Well, bam. Well, bam. So um, at this point, you, you can you know make it look a little cleaner. So you can click on the levels and drag them out and do what you need to do. Grab them out with this thing. Uh, there's just one here. Oh, there is. Oh, I see. Yep. Oh, hey, look, they both moved. Yep, they're connected. Yep. So smart. All right. So we got our curtain walls. Our Dimensions on there. Oh, never mind. I don't know what that little green line is. It's the little reference line. Yeah, I got rid of it. Okay. So now that we have it dimensioned, um, we're going to create our reference bubbles details. Mm -hmm. Or like, actually uh, put the details on them. So we're going to use what's called this place ref. Which, which is on the modeling tab. So we go to place ref. It's going to look at your project. Again, same dialog box. You hit the checkbox. Hit OK. And what it's doing now is it's detecting all the mullions, the profiles, and comparing it to uh, what we have in our details. So it's seeing that I have a 1117X and a 1601. And then it's looking and it's seeing that, oh, there's a detail one on 501, that's a sill that matches it. So if you click on it, you can see that little preview of it. And that's, this is what's in the draft of you. This is, this is perfect, this is our detail. And you, you can change the orientation of where you want the bubble to be, top or bottom. Typically it, it'll tell you the right one. Um, and then you just hit this place. And then it's encoded and go to the next one. So this is the head. Oh, I was hoping I would see it, but it's off the screen. But you can kind of see it down there. It's yeah, I placed it down there. Once we put them all, we can show. Them. Yeah. So continue the same process. You know, I have my head detail. So if you had a whole bunch of details, you can kind of look at the preview and just select which one you want. Shouldn't it list the cock joint? 
Uh, oh, I guess that's not part of the family, really. No, it's not part of the family. But you're going to have to pick the one that has the right cock joint. Yeah. Then you continue the process, just in place. I think that's only at the cell, Zach. Yeah, it has a cell track here. Yeah, but it probably should list the cock joint, too. Be a good idea. But the, but the problem is you don't really know because the family name isn't in the detail for the cock joint. Anyway. Continue the process with the jams. Place that one. Vertical. Oh. Ooh. Well, it's probably didn't find the picture. Ooh, ooh. Place. And there you go. So now it's all placed. You can probably bring this one up a little bit. Huh? I would bring right. it up a little bit, but. Oh, that's fine. What, like this? It's not moving. There it goes. Like that? Oh, oh, this thing here. Yeah, there you yeah, go. It's a little bit off. That's just me being picky, but. Right. So that's the place ref. You can also place one. Um, if you go back to uh, WW modeling and then hit this place one ref. You can, you know, select mullion that uh, you just want to place it on one of them. I've never hit this button before. It's fancy. It's probably the same thing. Yeah, same thing. And then you place it. There you go. Oh, neato. Cool. Okay. All of our details are on there now. Uh, let's go to the run tag and X's. So another thing we do is put an X for the unit size and then the glass bubble. Um, if you go to modeling and hit this tag and X, click that. And then you want to select the unit that you want to tag uh, with the X and the glass type. Typically it's the far left. You just do that one and then you can just hit finish. And there you go. So there's your X. And the one appeared because we designated the glass type. Um, if it wasn't designated, it would be blank. All right. So there's our tag and X. And then let's just turn off the crop border so that. Uh, just a quick question there. If you're doing that tag and X, and let's say the next unit over was a different glass type, is it a different command to only put the glass if you don't want to also put the X? Exactly. There's no. It's a drop-down menu. So if you only want the X, or if you only want the glass bubble, you would select that. Good question, Bill. Hmm. All right. So let's turn off the crop view. So you can. Either Yana, do a... Yana had a question too. Oh, she did. Uh, in chat, she says it seems the export of needed profiles could be improved. Doing it one by one and looking at profile PDFs seems tedious. What is the secret slash actual way to do it? Um, are you referring to like loading in the mullions? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. So I think there's a there's this load mullions database which works off the gen notes that that Esley creates for the profile set. So I think when you click this, it just asks you for the gen notes database. Yes. Esley's gen notes database, and then it loads in all those. So Correct. That's that's the secret way. That's the secret way. Yeah. All right. So let's get rid of this crop border. So you can either click this down here, which is a little light bulb by a crop view, or you can select oh. crop region vis visible here. Either one. Oh, I always did this. That's either cool. one. I didn't know about that button down there. Now it turns it off. And the last couple things are to place this on a sheet. So, um, what we need to do is go to our sheet. It's already made here, uh, 201 elevation. Double click that. And then we need to drag in our elevation. So this is located in the elevation 38 section. Grab it, drag it over, and then it places that on the sheet. And you see that it's still big, so you could um, move that closer if you need to. And this border depends on the crop view, so you could have we could have made the crop view a little smaller, and then it would have made it. Uh, yeah, let's do that. Bigger. 
So you could double click into here, um, just like it was a uh, paper space in AutoCAD. Exactly. You double click into model space into the viewport, and you can double click out. It behaves just like AutoCAD does. And then um, for elevations, uh, if you click on it, um, the view once, you would change mm -hmm. this from WW viewport to WW elevation. And that gives you your um, required oh. and the uh, architectural reference, or sorry, the, where they are going to go on the building north, that, south, east. Way. That's cool. Didn't know that existed. Right. How do I ch how do I change this name here? Uh, you can either change it there, or you can click here and rename, or you can do it here. There's a couple different ways. Do it here. Or you can also put a title on sheets, so it, that stays the same. It just changes what you see on here. So it depends on what you want to do. Oh, I see. So if I put in like strip window here. Yeah, it just has to be unique. And then yeah, if you move your mouse out into the view, oh, so okay. it, it changes here, but it doesn't change. But right. the name of the view is still this one. Cool. Yeah. OK. What about the required thing? How do I set that up? You just put that here, elevations required. Ah. And the same thing same. with our ref. And you guys are at the one hour mark right now. It's three o'clock. All right. I think we got one more thing to set the elevation number, and then we'll mm -hmm. skip the checking and we'll skip the printing. But uh, the last thing to do to get this ready for takeoff is to make sure it has an elevation number. So if you go to, let's just do it in 3D. Okay. So, uh, we need to be able to set the elevation number for each of the elevations. So if you click on the uh, wall, there's a parameter under data uh, called uh, elevation. So we need to be able to identify what elevation this is. Um, if it's a single digit, you want to make sure you put a 01, like a zero in front of it, 01, 02, 03, and then um, you know, all the way to 10, and so on and so forth. So now that the elevation number is assigned, you would then check it. We're not going to show you that process, but um, you check it and then you would, in our case, since we only have one, we would print, uh, print using shop one. Yeah. All right. Does anyone want to see those processes or are we okay just skipping those? I think we're probably okay. Any questions while I... Yana has a note in the chat. Make sure it is 0102, not 1 and 2. Mm -hmm. I'm saving this Revit file right now, Gabe, so... Yeah, I'm opening mine so I can open it. Hopefully it doesn't take too long to save. Uh, if you were gonna print this, you just hit the shop plot button. It asks you what page, which pages you wanna print and where you want to save it. And then it just goes off and does that. All right, any questions? Or I think everybody's good on that part. Just repeat the process for every elevation. It's still saving. OK, there it goes. All right, so I'll close this, Gabe, and stop sharing. So you can do the takeoff. That was easy, Gabe. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Anytime. The power right. of teamwork. This is the one you made, right, Zach? You just saved over. Yeah, yeah, I just saved over it. I didn't give it a new name. So now we're going to take this thing off. 
And I think a lot of people were interested in this part because, you know, a lot of people didn't have a, a lot of time to go over it. So. Yeah, we may also run out of time, but we'll see. <laughs> All right, Zach, take it away. There it is. Right on. OK, so for takeoff steps, uh, the first step is to open the takeoff program. Looks like you already have that. Yes. So let me show everybody my daughter, and then I'll show you the takeoff 2016. <laughs> so that's here. I just double clicked it, and it opened it up. All right, and then um, we'll want to create a new database. So. Go back to your takeoff program. Okay. And then in the very upper right, let me get my annotations going too. Arrow, just like you. Why isn't it drawing anything? I don't see it drawing. Oh, I have this. I should have done stamp. Stamp arrow. There we go. Oh, it's so tiny on your screen. It is super small. How do I change that? I don't know. Create a new project. Oh, there we go. That's a little better. Yeah, create a new project. And then um, usually this goes into the drafting takeoff folder. So, but of course, on this, we're working off of the, uh, the M drive. So go to where this Revit file is. We'll want to put it in that same folder. Operations, drafting, Operations, drafting Zoom site, flip flop live. Uh, oh, I guess we don't have that folder structure. So we'll just put it right in here. There's already a units folder in here. That's suspicious. But let's let's make a takeoff folder. Yeah. I don't know, maybe these were, someone added those in or something. And then, yeah, give it a name. Usually we name the database after the job so that if it moves around, we know what job it is. Um, you can just call it flip flop. And hit save. Save. Okay, this will take a second. It's reading some stuff off the server, copying some data down, making some folders in that in that location. But when it's done, um, it will say up here at the top of the takeoff program, new job, or something like that. Maybe I should have saved it to my desktop. It'll be fine. It would definitely run faster, but. Updating the info. Yep. So this is the same process that anyone in the takeoff group or the panel group would do to make a new database to start saving all the stuff that they're putting into the drawings. So it says new job there. Um, our next step is to go to project information here and put in the job name and job number up here at the top. So flip flop and for job number, the notes say to put in 10-253. That's sort of a fake job number that we use for testing. But the key is this has to match whatever's in Revit, right? Yeah, and I don't know if I put I don't think I put the job number in Revit, so maybe we should show that. Uh, I think if it's, it's not already, already there. In. Let me just make this bigger. So if you go to manage project information, and you can see that yeah. it's already there. So this has to match what the takeoff program is showing. If it doesn't match, the takeoff program will, or it'll give you a warning. And that's just to prevent people from uh, putting the wrong job into the wrong database because it's happened before. All right, and now now you can see it says flip-flop here at the top. All right, 
So you can minimize the takeoff program. We're not going to touch it for a while. But know that whatever you have open in the takeoff program is where, um, where the stuff that you do in Revit or AutoCAD gets saved um, or read from. So now that we have that open and we're on our new database, we can start to do work here. So the first thing um, that we do here is go to the WW takeoff tab and we'll run UPD, which is right there. And UPD is short for update database. And basically what it's doing is it's reading all of the data in the Revit file and saving the important parts into the database so that um, so we can do more work after that. Uh, this, it does the same thing in AutoCAD as well, which we will be hitting eventually. Um, another thing that it does is it automatically numbers these units. So if you click on the unit, it says here in the properties pane what the unit number is. So that one is unit three. And that was decided by the takeoff program based on what mullions, what glass, the size of everything, um, all that information gets compressed into just one little unit number. That's unit two. This next one should also be unit two because they're identical. And then this one is unit one. Cool. Cool. All right, so we're gonna create a palette schedule. Um, this is what Saul and Quentin do. Um, usually they will um, send the, well, nowadays they, um, they put this Revit file onto BIM 360 and send a link to the field guy who who tells them which units go in which order and in which palettes. And then they get that back from them and import it in. But we're going to do the manual process because we don't have all that stuff here. So can you go to WW takeoff ribbon tab and then unit sequence button? And you can just make that a little wider. So this is the unit sequencer. Um, if you hit refresh down at the bottom, it's going to load in the units in the takeoff program, which for us is four units, a one, two twos, and a three. And they're not palletized. That's why they're up here in this uh, unassigned, unsequenced area. So to start off our sequence, we always want to start with a release. So hit that first button there. That creates a new release in the sequence and then hit the second button. That's going to create a palette, which is automatically named palette one. And you can think of these as a stack of cards. Um, a release card starts a new release. A palette card starts a new palette. And then all the units will go under that in an order. And then another palette card, and then more units, and then another palette card, and more units, and then a release card, and you know that kind of thing. So he's we're going to build a small stack of. Uh, of cards here that say what the sequence is. So then, so hit this little plus button here. That's going to make it so that you can start sequencing units and they go into this palette. So you want to start on the left. Usually that's how our palette schedules go. They go from left to right. So pick units. Um, it will only allow you to select units that are in the database. So you should be able to click that. Yeah, and one thing also to note, you probably have to do the little thing too where you. Oh, the pan? Where you pan. So click it. And then once you click it, the unit leaves the unassigned area and, and it becomes green and is now in the palette schedule. And also in your view, it's not ghosted, it's solid. So you could tell which units you still have to palletize um, because it'll still be ghosted. So go ahead, just go across, click each unit in turn. And now everything is assigned. Um, you could hit escape in Revit to stop that command. And that's our palette schedule. And then to save it, you just hit the save button at the bottom. And that will save it back to that same database that we have open. So it's also, is it also assigning them in Revit? Not, uh, not at that point. You'd have to run UPD again. Got it. So, let, and we should do that. So go to WW takeoff and run UPD this thing. So UPD does two things. It 
reads all the stuff in Revit, writes it to the takeoff program, but then it also takes stuff that the takeoff program knows about, like this pallet schedule, and writes it into the Revit file. That's why the Revit file gets locked after a UPD. That's why your groups get broken after a UPD, that kind of thing. So now when you click on there, you should see this is week one, day one, and it's on pallet one. It should be all the same, right? They should all be week one, day one, pallet one, yeah. Because yep. that's what the cards say. All right. So the next step is to create the tag drawing. So the database knows about all of these units here and what families and their geometry. So now we can ask it, uh, ask either Revit or AutoCAD to draw those uh, unit drawings. So if you go here to create tag drawing, again in the WW takeoff tab, it'll pop up a window where you can choose where you want to output the, the units. So um, make a new folder here called units. This is just where we normally store these things. Double click on that and then select the folder by hitting the button. And then it lists all the units and elevations. This is for this top one here is for field use, uh, which would be the track in this case. Uh, and then these three are the units inside of that elevation. So go ahead and draw all three of those units. You can use uh, shift select or shift click to select all of them. And we're going to draw the, both the metal and the glass tags for those three units. OK. And, and the output path is, again, listed up there. Hit OK. And hopefully this works. Sometimes it gets a little wonky. It's always better to run this in AutoCAD. I've had much more success running this in AutoCAD. It should work the same way, and it looks like it is going to work. Um, but sometimes the Revit one gets a little weird. So I have a different planes tag, something tag on different plane. Yeah, um, that's a warning because your your tag lines aren't all on the z equals zero plane. Some of them are up or down a little bit. Um, it's just a warning. You can um, safely ignore those. Hit OK. In this case, yeah, hit OK. Especially now, right now, while we're uh, working on this. All right, so we created the tag drawings. Let's open up AutoCAD and open up one of those drawings. Let's do unit uh, unit three, because that's the one on the far left. Should I always work. From home, 2016? Uh, you can open either one. Surprise me. From home. Hopefully your S drive is relatively up to date. Yeah, good question. That is a good question. Maybe you should do the other one, <laughs> just in case. The other one? Yeah, let's do the other one just in case. In case your S drive isn't fully up to date. So we get all the, as Pedro would say, latest and greatest stuff that he's made. So this is another plug, make sure your S drive is up to date. Everyone? Yeah, there's, um, you don't have it on your computer, or you don't have a link to it. Maybe I should sh show you guys how to do that. So if you're using the from home AutoCAD, you're, you're using a copy, a very shallow, incomplete copy of the S drive that is on your hard drive. And it does not get updated automatically. So as things change on the S drive, like details get updated or whatever, um, you won't have them. So you won't see them in the parts library. You won't see them anywhere. So if you need to update that, um, you need to connect to VPN, first of all. Make sure S drive is connected. And then, yeah, open up, get your file browser up here. Go to S drive. Um, scroll down to WWopt right here. And then if you scroll down again, there's one called S Drive Sync 2016 or 2020, depending on which AutoCAD version you have. Um, he's not going to do it now because it's going to take a while. Yes. But um, you would run that if you 
have if there's if it's been a while this thing could take an hour two hours depending on your internet connection uh, it could be 15 minutes uh if you've done it before and not very many files have changed then it it goes relatively fast but that's how you update your local s drive which is what your from home autocad uses when it goes to the parts library so that's probably uh, important for for uh, jumpstart mostly, and the takeoff group because the fabs come from there. All right, you said open the units. Yeah. All right. Did you go in the right folder? You are in the right folder. You are on DWGs. Can you browse there? Where do those units go? No, not that units. Go into takeoff units. Oh. Yes. You put them in takeoff units. There you go. Open three? Yep. So this is what the takeoff program did with your Revit file. Oh, it looks like you put data on here, Pedro. You sneak. <laughs> so um, you don't have the takeoff properties window up. So can you type in takeoff properties? Yeah, that's something else. Takeoff properties. So this is a window that helps you um, deal with everything basically in the takeoff group. I don't know where it is. Did it open up on the other monitor? No, it's still loading. Oh, yeah, it is. There it is. There it is. So it tells you this is unit three, and these are all your taglines that um that were created when we ran the create tag drawings or create create unit drawings function in revit okay uh if you go to model space you can uh click on some of these tags just as a quick little go through if you click on a line there it well that's the glass but if you click on one of the mullions it highlights over here which one you clicked on And vice versa. If you click on a line item in the thing, it should highlight in AutoCAD. Cool. Yeah. It's hard to see in this at this resolution. Yeah. All right. So our first step according to the uh, according to the list here is to name the details in the UD window. So type in UD as a UD. command. UD, and then it's going to ask you to select a a bubble or a tagline or a mark number, uh, but you can also just hit enter and it'll just open up the window. And that's what that thing was that you closed earlier, this thing. Um, just to make sure we're all up to date, hit this refresh button. Sure. And that will download everything off. Are you sure. Yeah, yeah. All right. Discard? Yeah. It should look the same. I'm guessing. Cool. So this is the database. This is a part of the the takeoff program database. Um, it already has the mullions that we got from Revit listed here. This all came off of the server and it was all pre-made by by uh, Pedro and checked by Joe. So this is all the data that was made for the families that were created for drafting. All came in automatically just by UPDing and drawing these uh, drawings. But it doesn't know what detail number each of these mullions is supposed to be. So we have to rename these um, to match. So go ahead and start with this first one. Oh, another thing is this is sort of a cascade of information here. Whatever detail you select over here on the upper left, it will show you the uses or the different tagline names that you can have for the in that detail. OK, if you click on one of these, one of the uses, it will show you down here in the assembly box what parts 
are in that use. And then if you click on a part, it will show you which miscellaneous goes with that part. So as a pretty good example, let's go to um, let's go to the horizontal. Oh wait, there's no horizontal. Let's go to the head. There, that's the head. These are the head taglines. And if you click on say this this one that's the head jam to jam. Oh, there's only one part. Where's the filler? Oh, the filler's on a separate tagline. I was hoping there would be one that has, oh, there we go. This is a field use line, but there's three parts here. And each one of these parts can have a different set of, of uh, miscellaneous items. So that first one had no screws. This one has a 13 GP and that one also has a 13 GP. So it's kind of a cascade of tables. Um, that's just an aside. So let's uh, rename these detail numbers so they match what we have in Revit. So that one is one on 501. And you'll notice that these slashes here are backslashes. That's very important. They should always be backslashes. We need the, the five point. You need the, you need the decimal point, yeah. And then um, the second one is also one on 501. But, to, but we can't have the same name on both of these. So what we usually do is we put a semicolon, and then we can type in whatever we want after that to differentiate them. So on this one, put 501, uh, and that one is the actual sill. What? Put in one on Semicolon one. after the 501. After, yeah, one oh, backslash. Sure. Yeah. Do it there. Yeah, and then so put track after the semicolon. Oh, OK. You want to press that. Got it. Yeah. And then this one, one on 501, and then a semicolon and sill dead load or something. I don't know. Whatever so, you want right there. I don't takeoff group may have standards for those, but let's just keep it simple. So that one is uh, uh, that's the right jam. So that's three backslash 551. And you could put something a semicolon there too if you wanted to make it a little easier to read. That one's the head, so that's two on 501. Then both of those are two on 551. Two, you case? Yeah, one of those is, a. You, uh, you can't have the same name, right? So you have to add a semicolon and say, uh, that one's the male vertical. Perfect. And then this one's one on 551. We're just translating what Revit family name goes to which mm -hmm. detail. Exactly. Got it. So that they have names. And so now, um, yeah. OK, so click off of that one that you have there, and then hit this Apply button. And the Apply button will save those changes to the database. One. And whenever that finishes, our database is on the network. So what is it doing? Just it's just renaming them on the database? Yeah. Yeah, basically. Where'd your mouse go? Oh. It's it's pushing it to the database and then rereading the database. Yeah, I just got one. Something yeah, something popped up there. That's a little weird. Cool. I think it's just switching. OK, so you can uh, move your mouse out off of that page, and it should automatically shrink. Um, so now go to paper space. And what we're going to do is we're going to ask it to redraw all these taglines. And now that we have detailed numbers on everything, it will automatically draw our detail bubbles for this unit drawing. OK. So we'll go to WW takeoff up there at the top. 
and do this draw all tags button. Um, because you're already in the unit drawing, it just assumes that you want to redraw all the tags for this drawing for this unit three. So yes, delete existing metal and glass tags and draw new ones. It's going to redraw it. And hopefully if we did everything right, there would be detail bubbles or not. There isn't. Oh, OK. And so, not assigned. so yeah, exactly. So looking at this uh, left side here on the takeoff properties window, you can see that all those detail numbers that we typed in are are listed here and they've been applied to our taglines. But this one down here at the bottom, which is the setting block. Setting block. So we need to add a detail for this setting block. OK. So you have to go back here? Yeah, go to the UD window. Um, the Revit resource. What is the Revit resource? It's you that name. You can grab it from ACAD parts, yeah. Oh, we can grab it from ACAP parts? Yeah, that Let's... one, I don't know why it doesn't come in, but it's it's on the server. Do we want to grab it from ACAP parts? OK, let's grab it from ACAP parts. So type in the ACAD parts command in AutoCAD. So this, this command will bring up a very similar window to the one you just saw, except it's not using your database. It's using the server. So you can see all the data that's been made for every family ever. And I don't know how long it's going to take to open. That's why I was a little hesitant. So why didn't it come in? Uh, because this isn't a mullion and it's not, I mean, this thing is relatively new, the whole setting block thing. Hmm. So it hasn't been updated to pull those in. For now, couldn't you just delete the tag off the elevation on the unit and then we run it again? Well, this gets drawn automatically, so I, I'm trying to get get the detail bubbles. So I need to draw it. Okay, so you probably want to organize this by Revit resource. So click on the top, and then scroll down. What's the Revit resource? It's right above. It's a. It's just setting block. Right there. So oh, just sweet. look for the one you need. So 26. we're doing 280, 286 inches, yeah. So copy that whole line. So you'll have to click over here, right click, and then copy. And then you can go to your actual database window. Paste Select it. over here, right click, paste. There you go. Hit apply again to save it. And the program doesn't let us use control C, control V for the specific yeah. table. So you have to right click, copy, right click, paste. Mm -hmm. You can close. close. This. Yeah, you can close that. I don't think we'll need it anymore. I hope no. we won't. OK, so draw all tags again. So it doesn't update. Oh, wait, wait, wait. We need to uh, give that thing a detail number. Sorry. Right now it's called that thing. So we want to change that to. I don't know. Usually we. Uh... Semi calling as B. Really? Setting okay. block. Well, I mean, one on one, 501. One backslash 501. Sorry, Gabe. It's all good. Good? Yep. Hit apply. apply. Can't hit apply right now because you're still in that box. There. Now you can hit apply. OK. It's saving much quicker now. Now draw all tags again. But does not update right? No. Uh, it only updates when you run this draw all tags. Or you can double click on this thing and change it manually. But we want it to come in, auto, come in through draw tags, because draw tags will draw the actual detail bubbles if everything has a name. There you go. It drew two of these uh, sill ones because, uh, because of the setting block tag. So you can erase one of those detail bubbles. Here? Yeah. It's just an auto it's just an AutoCAD object. Perfect. So now we have detail bubbles. All right, now we're on step eight. We're gonna UPD this thing into the database. And this is where all the magic happens. So there is a UPD button here. 
up there, update database, but usually I just type it out. So go ahead and hit that UPD. So just like in Revit, it's analyzing this drawing, writing a bunch of stuff to the takeoff program, and then generating stuff on this uh, drawing as well. So one of the things that it's right now, it's figuring out what the mark numbers are of all these parts. Um, it has to figure out how long they all are. Uh, it's all using that database. These taglines that are these white lines around the outside edge, those taglines have names and details that map back to these um, detail, the database entries that we saw, which tells it which parts to use and then all that information is converted into how long this thing is and what mark number it needs to be. Right now it's trying to figure out mark numbers and they don't have default assigned prefixes. So it's asking it, do you want to just use MM for those parts? We're going to say yes. And it keeps going, writes it all to the database, writes the mark numbers back in, draws these little tables here. And now it's going to draw the BIM model. So the BIM model, it's going to take each of these parts, extrude it in 3D in AutoCAD, um, add in whatever notches are on the fab templates for those parts. And I'm saying it faster than it's actually doing it because <laughs> we're working off the server. But once this is done, we should be able to go to model space and see this whole unit in 3D and AutoCAD with all the parts and all the notches based on what we got off of the server automatically. So far, that right vertical is not populating a mark yep. number. There's no mark number there. So there's something we're going to have to investigate. Because there is a vert tagline there. But it probably just doesn't know what to do with that particular vertical, with this particular sill and this particular head. And that's probably why it's blank. Now, this is searching the server for die pictures. So that's one of the reasons this is taking a bit. It's copying fab templates and from the server and putting them in your, your uh, fabs folder. Um, well, that's working. If you want, uh, Katan has a question in the chat. Oh, I didn't see that. So Katan said, this is for the video. That's why I'm reading it out loud. Uh, entering details in takeoff windows. Can we drop down menu of related details of profile from Revit model? What if we can publish detail number database from Revit model and use it in takeoff browser? Uh, it could definitely be done. Um, we didn't have all of those names in there before. Um, and this also, this tool came from AutoCAD. So that obviously was didn't exist in AutoCAD, but there could be some shortcuts like that built in. Um, because, I mean, Alan's tool is figuring out which uh, families are in which details. Uh, this could certainly do the same thing. Still creating the model. I hope we don't have to run UPD again. It should be faster the, the, in the future because the first one, it's copying a bunch of fab tickets over. Now, uh, the second one, it won't have to copy so many. And it's searching in multiple folders for these things if it's not finding it. Then once all those come in, what are your steps to start investigating why that right vertical mark number is not showing up on your unit drawing? Um, well, because there is no vertical, uh, no mark number there, um, I would go to the UD window and see what data that thing is actually trying to be. Like what what's the data behind it? Is the data blank? Um, is there a use missing? Um, What's the deal? 
And like I said, I think it's what you guys ran into during the offsite is that that thing um, doesn't have any data that says what happens at that specific sill and that specific head. So we'll have to make it. We checked that the families existed, but I don't know if we checked that the, all the uses existed, right? Yeah, like when, when you guys make data for a family, you're making it for that one job. And if this condition didn't happen for when that family was made, it wouldn't have any data for it. Like they're not making, they're not taking every new vertical and defining what happens with that vertical on every sill that's ever existed because that may never come up. Like most of that would be wasted work. So it just kind of has to be taken uh, as they come. All right, I think it's done. Okay, so hit okay and go to model space by going to TM or hitting that model tab. You can see it dropped in all this cool 3D geometry and you can uh, use your view cube or something like that to, to view it. It has notches where it knew what to do. So like on the vertical, you'll see notches. Can you change it up here to, uh, yeah. I like wireframe, but I understand most people don't. So yeah, you can see it came in with notches and those notches were made by Pedro on a fab template. So if you click on that vertical, any, any part of it, you'll see that the takeoff property switched over from tags to model and it's showing you what you just clicked on. You can right click on this and open the fab template and I'll show you the fab template that it copied off the server for this particular situation, for this part. Um, it looks like this one actually was a combination of things off the server. So it generated this fab template based on what's on the server and it has that, has that notch in it. It's the same notch, um, has some gaskets, some attached parts. All that's kind of done for you automatically. If we were to add a notch into this fab template, then it would also appear into in the um, in, in the unit drawing and vice versa. If you add a notch, uh, and we'll do that if we get, if we have enough time, I don't think we will, but if we have enough time, you could draw a notch in either either here or the unit drawing and it will appear in the other to keep them coordinated. All right, go ahead and close that, Gabe. Um, I don't know if I want to go into that because we are, we're at 20 minutes left. Yeah. So, uh, we can get something in there very fast though. It may, it won't be right, but it'll be there at least. You want to do that? Yeah, we got 20 minutes, 15 minutes. Okay. So I say do it last. I say, let's do it now. I think it's more important than some of this other stuff. It's all optimized and clicking buttons and waiting. Um, so open up, go to the project details so we can see what our data is and go to that vertical, which is this, uh, these two, right? It's the male side is the one that we're dealing with on that one. So what these all mean is, um, sorted by part use. So it's a little clearer. So, and I'm going to start down here with, uh, with vert 138, because that's where our, um, that's the name of our tagline. If you go back to the takeoff properties window um, and go to, go to tags up here, that male vertical was this one down here, vert 138. So in investigating this, I see I have this detail with this name and I do have that in my project details. So go back to the UD window. It is here, but what's being taken off with that? Nothing down here. Um, but there are there's this whole other level to this called rules, which are these blue things over here on the right. Um, so if this vertical is running from this tagline to this tagline, it's gonna do, it's gonna, oh, don't move your mouse too far away. Uh, it's gonna do this use. 
if it's this tagline to this tagline, it's going to do this one, the data under this use. So it kind of takes one tag name, which is easy ish to type. And depending on what's around it, it will do different data things depending on what is happening. So um, we need to make one that that is named after the sill and the head that we have in question here. So I'm just going to cop, we're just going to copy a couple of these to do it very quickly. Does that sound good? Let's copy this one for the head. Right click on that, copy, and paste it down here. And then we'll also do this sill, the one that I have my arrow on. We'll just copy that one because it's sill to sill. Paste. Perfect. OK. So the names of these things, this one's, this particular one here is running in head blah, blah, blah to in head blah, blah, blah. Uh, let's look at what our head is named. So go back out to the, uh, yeah, go out to here. It's our head is named that. So you can click on this and copy it from up here. You have your quick properties. Yeah, just copy that. OK, and then go move back your, to that. Move your arrow. Oh, sorry. There you go. OK, and then you can go in here and rename this so that instead of in head, whatever, it says that thing you copied. I did a, I did a right click copy. So well, you don't have to right click copy now. When you're doing the text, you can just do control C, control V. It's only when you're doing the whole row. So you should be able to control V right now. Cool. Yeah, there you go. And change the other one too. Sorry. It's it's there twice, yeah. In the dash? You want to keep the dash. Yeah, just like that, perfect. And then we'll want to do the same thing for the sill. So look at the sill? Yep. Go look at the sill name. Uh, that's the sill. There's a couple other things that are also on that detail, but that's like the face stop. That's what FS stands for, it's face stop. Mm -hmm. So the main body is sill, whatever. That's the one that we want. So change this one. Yep. So now the takeoff program in this window has data for what happens when this vertical is running head S250V to head S250V, or running that sill, whatever, I can't read it, it's too small. Um, and it will automatically take those two bits of information, make a rule for it, and also a situation when it's sill to head, which is what actually happens here. And we should get a mark number coming out the other side. Now, the notch for that mark number may be wrong right now. Um, the notch at the head may be wrong. Like all, some of that stuff, it may be the wrong length. Some of it's that stuff. You want to change it? I don't. I don't want to change it because we're going to run out of time. Okay. But at least there will be something there. Um, if we did want to change it, we could go through that if there's time at the end. Okay. So go ahead, hit apply to save all that fun stuff that we did on the UD window. And you should be able to re UPD. Now that there's data defining what that tagline is going to do, uh, running UPD again, which hopefully will be faster, will uh, pop out a mul a mullion. Maybe not the correct one, but there will be one. So if Joe is out there, he, he's probably screaming at his computer screen right now saying, but make it right. But time permits. You're reading my mind. I, I'm sorry, man. I, I just know you so well. It's scary, I think, like you sometimes, Joe. Hopefully, this one won't take five minutes. Then I think it's on a question. What about access holes and clear holes? Um, depends on what the access hole or clear hole is on. Um, if we're talking the joinery holes for connecting the head and the sill to the verticals. Um, those should be coming in automatically as well. Uh, I think the uh, 
the access holes for those should also be there. Um, if you're talking about sill tracks, um, if you were at the engineering meeting today, you, you saw me basically tag the sill track with hole locations. So um, for tracks, the holes are slightly different, but for oh, joinery well. stuff, um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get into that. It should have already automatically happened. Okay. Because of the data that Pedro made and the tickets that Pedro made. Pedro is a linchpin of this whole operation. And Joe checking him, keeping, keeping Pedro honest. So just like drafting in the Revit process, they get a bunch of uh, families from Team Esley um, and a bunch of details from Adventure or Team Esley. Um, there's a lot of setup that goes into this as well to, uh, to help make it go smoother. Yeah, this is just going to take a while because it's on the server. Maybe should have copied it over. Should have. It's painful. I can't watch. Uh, in the takeoff group, you end up running UPD a lot. You'll make a little change in the database, like we just we just did, and then run UPD again. And then you'll find something else to change. And then you'll go back to to the database, change something, run UPD again. So when it, we're in the office or doing it through our screen, it usually takes about 20 to 30 seconds compared to four minutes. Yeah, exactly. So it's a it's a very repetitive process. There's a cycle going on where you do some work, change a database, run UPD, do some more work, change the database, run UPD. So having a fast UPD is very important to them because um, yeah, they, they end up running UPD every every two minutes or so, probably, um, just to see that what they're doing is actually doing something. Or, I mean, you can plan it out to where you're not doing it very often, but it's inconvenient. So well, what are we going to be able to do after this then, Zach? So we're going to look at the fab templates and the fab tickets for this. Um, we'll show how those access holes and uh, clear holes are shown on the jam fab so that Katan can see that. And then we're just going to filter the units, optimize it, and make some uh, make uh, the takeoffs and draw all the fab tickets for this one unit. We're not going to go into the other units. And nine minutes? Uh, yeah. That's it. Maybe the fab tickets won't come out in that time because of the delay here. But we're not going to hit UPD again. We don't have time for that. And if this, the last one took five minutes and 30 seconds, this one looks like it's going to take five minutes and 30 seconds. So any other questions about this? It's all lines which have a name. The name is attached to data, and the data says what is taken off and what needs to be drawn at those specific locations. OK, that one did go a little faster. Not much, though. All right, so now we have a vertical there. Doesn't have the right notch, probably, um, but at least there's something. And it's probably in the right place. Oh, and our sill does not go through it. That's good. All right. All right, what are you next? Cool. Let's um, go back to the takeoff. Oh, let's look at some of the fab tickets, because that's probably mo the most important thing. Um, you can click on any of these um, model objects in AutoCAD, and they will highlight in the takeoff properties window on the left. And then once you have something that you want to look at, you can right click on it in the take in the uh, takeoff properties not over there in in the takeoff properties window here yeah so like this jam here you can right click on that and there's two things here there's the fab template which is a static it's a static file in your in your folder in your fabs folder and that defines what the notches will look like and kind of it's sort of the base template for whatever that fab is going to be 
And then there's also fab tickets, which are created on the fly, and they have a lot more information on them. So let's do the fab ticket, preview fab ticket. So what it's doing right now is it's taking the fab template, which is something you draw, it's a, it's or Pedro drew, um, and it's just a DWG that's sitting in a folder. And then it's taking that, it's adding the different intersections, uh, different parts that are intersecting it. And it's also adding in all the information, like what those parts, those intersecting parts are. It adds in the, the part number, the, the name, all the stuff in the title block. That all gets filled out uh, when you do a fab ticket. The fab template doesn't have any of that text. So this is where those uh, clear holes and access holes come from. There's a note built into the, uh, the definition that says the access holes are required here. This, um, there's little pictures that show what the hole layout is. Usually these are programmed by Tony, so we don't actually dimension the individual hole locations. Tony can just open up this, um, this file and measure them or open up the die drawings and measure where they are. Um, but this dimension up here at the top says we have this part two and a half inches from the bottom of the vertical and 118 inches, this other part from the bottom of the vertical. And then relative to that, you can figure out where the holes are. But that's all kind of done by, by Tony when he's programming the, the Quadra or whatever machine to drill these holes. And then he also puts an access hole. I hope that answers your question, Katan. Uh, Tony just puts in the dimensions from, from that reference datum, the two and a half, which is the top of the vertical or the top of the horizontal or the top of the head. He puts in the dimensions from the glass pocket and down to each one of these little holes. And then the program will spit out a programming file with all those locations. Um, but yeah, this this fab ticket is sort of, a, this is what the shop will get in the end. Um, so the takeoff group can look at these and make sure there's no like lines intersecting each other. These are all composed on the fly when it's asked, because if you, look at the fab template, the fab template doesn't have any of this text up here at the top, it doesn't have anything in the in the uh, title block at the bottom, and it doesn't even have the head and the sill in it, or this access hole note. That all comes in be, um, from uh, other template, template files that say what these things look like, and then they're composed together to make this ticket. And you can see what those look like if you click over here in the takeoff properties window. There's this can attach, whatever, this sill. If you click on that, it'll give you a preview of what that, that thing looks like. It has a model space sill, and it has this, uh, and it has the uh, access hole note that goes along with it. So this drawing, these two drawings, the paper space and the model space part, um, get added onto this fab ticket to produce this final picture here at the bottom and up here in paper space. So these are all on the server made by Pedro. If you have to make one of your own, um, you have to do stuff, but we're not going to go over that. Yeah, you can right click on almost all those things in the takeoff properties window and see different things, different things you can do. You can edit those pictures if you need to, and that will change it for all fab tickets that use that same picture. All right, that was that. Cool. You can play with that on your own. Um, let's go back to the takeoff program. So, and you can just maximize it. We don't need AutoCAD anymore. Okay. All right, so we're gonna click on this button here and hopefully units week one is there. It is not. So just pick, uh, let's go to elevation info, actually. Go here to elevation info. We have to refresh it because the last time we op we looked at this thing was before we made the palette schedule. Um, so it doesn't have the week one release that we made when we made the palette schedule. So go ahead, close that. Just wanted to open something really fast and now that drop down button will have a units week one. That was produced when we made the pallet schedule. So if you click on that, we should see here that there are four units in week one. I always like to check that, make sure it makes sense. It only says there's one light, 
But the reason it says that is because we've only UPD'd one unit. We UPD'd unit three. We didn't UPD any of the other units. If we UPD'd those, then there would be more lights. There'd be four lights there. Um, so once we have our filter set, now we're going to release all of week one. If we were going to make the metal takeoff, we have to optimize. So we're going to click on this optimize extrusion button right there. This will take everything that's in our filter and organize it onto stock lengths so that we uh, can find out how much we have to order. Or in the case of a, a fab release, um, exactly what parts are cut out of each stock length. So there's a bunch of options here. Um, we're going to make a takeoff. So go ahead, click on that takeoff. And we'll do, we'll do original for now. That's fine. Just hit OK. Oh, probably want to automatically generate. No, don't do that. It's going to take a while. <laughs> Let's just hit OK. Um, so it's going to try and put all those parts on 288 inch stock lengths. Um, setting block included, probably need to turn that one off. But it'll take all our main parts, hit OK. Hit OK. Again, we don't want to change that. That's just a default that it probably should never ask you for anymore. But I don't know what sales does. <laughs> so this is the summary of the optimization. We're going to need one stock length of each one of these parts, 24 feet. Um, this is how much of the uh, the stock length we're actually using. So five feet, 10 feet for some of them. This is how much of that stock length we're actually using by a percentage. And this, this is a rough estimate of how much of that stock length we're throwing away in dollars. Not an accurate number by any means. It's kind of a guess. But uh, it's roughly what we're wasting on each. So if you have a, a lot of units, obviously this waste and if we actually picked good stock length sizes, the uh, waste cost will be a lot lower, or our yield percentage would be higher. It would be closer to like 95 98%. Um, so we'll be throwing away a lot less. Um, so that's something that Yana has to do when she's optimizing these. Um, she picks different stock length sizes so that she gets a better yield, so we're not throwing away as much metal. And it's, it's there's- Tony. Well, Tony too. There's an art form there, so. And uh, go you're ahead. running a little over. Are there any last minute points that you want to make? Yeah, yeah. Uh, go ahead, close that. If we're going to make the metal takeoff form or the metal order form, uh, we use the buttons in this column right here. So the metal order form is down there. So we can export the, the order form that would be used. D go, don't do that just because we don't have time. It's pretty simple. You just say where you want to save it and makes an Excel file. Um, glass is up here. Same thing. You say where you want to save it, and it spits them all out so that they can be sent to the PM who uh, does their magic. I don't know. They shouldn't be doing anything. And then handing it directly to purchasing. So, And then to draw fab tickets, there's this button here. And that will draw all the fab tickets for whatever your filter is in AutoCAD. So it'll generate all those fab ticket drawings in whatever folder you tell it to. And then you can print them out from there and make a release. So that's generally how it goes. And then, yeah, we're done. Done with the takeoff and fabs. Any other questions? Where do you go to make work orders? Uh, over here. Is, is that a question for me? So uh, after you've printed out all your fab tickets and um, and your key unit key drawings, which I didn't we didn't show you how to do, uh, if you're going to make work orders and send it to the shop, you would click that button, and uh, it will uh, make a work order for the shop to execute all the different fabrication and assembly of this filter, which is week one. I have a question. What's the minimum and maximum stock link sizes we can put in there? It varies by part. Uh, in the As far as the takeoff program goes, it'll let you put in almost any number. Um, but in reality, uh, the minimum part that we want typically is around 15 feet. And the maximum, we don't 
because of the quadra, we don't want parts that are longer than um, than about 28 and a half or so feet. So um, there are exceptions, of course. There are um, there's a list. I think if you go to uh, standards somewhere, somewhere in the wiki, there's a list of all of the parts that we want shorter than 29 or 28 feet because they're flimsy and they flex a lot and they're they don't go through the um, the planet very well because because the clamps have to be a certain distance apart and all this stuff. So there's a a bunch of limitations like that. For estimating, I don't I don't think we care too much. We just go 24 foot. Um, but yeah, there are some limits. Okay. okay. And you can, there are also exceptions. You can talk to the extruder. Heather can get an ex exemption and we can get a 32 foot stock length. But typically they're all under 30 feet, probably under 29 feet and never going higher than that. Unless we have really tall units. All right, sounds good. Anything else? All right, I think that's it. If you guys uh, have any other questions, let us know. Hopefully this helped and hopefully answer some of your questions. You can always go back when we post the video and walk through it as well. Yep, all this should work on your own computer. I suggest having it on your hard drive though. Yes. All right, thanks a lot guys. Okay. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thanks, Zach, Gabriel, thanks. Thanks, Zach. Thanks, Gabe. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.